able to uh, meet with your people, uh, to have fellowship, and to grow with each other towards you. Uh, we pray you will bless us uh, today that, that all things will be done to your honor and glory and that uh, more people can, can live more faithfully to you uh, because of our time here together today. Uh, we pray, Lord, for those who are suffering right now, especially those who are suffering nearby uh, with all the destruction from the tornadoes the other night. Uh, we specifically lift up to you uh, the Tim Arnold family and uh, in the law we pray you will be with them as they try to to figure things out and to be able to have a place to stay and and to be able to rebuild uh, one day we pray for the churches in those areas that they can serve um, serve those communities well and uh, even though this is a horrific thing that has happened that uh, maybe there's someone out there searching for you that come, can come in contact with your people and to learn the truth. Um, we pray for us that we can find ways to help out and help us to be generous with our time and our money to help those who are in need. We pray, Lord, for others who are, are struggling right now with illnesses. We want to mention uh, Julie Pinkerton's name, things she's going through right now. We pray for Janet Langley and her eyes, and we pray everything will go well with her appointment. Uh, we are so thankful to see uh, both Donna and Pauletta here, and they're feeling better, and uh, we pray you will continue to walk with them uh, through this time. Uh, we know there's many others, Lord, that are struggling, uh, and we just pray that you will be with them all, and that you will give them uh, faith and strength and comfort and that these times of, of trial uh, will not uh, make them hopeless, but to instead put their hope in you. We pray, Lord, that you'll be with us as we continue on our studies of the dark forces that are all around us. Uh, we pray, Lord, that our study today will help us to understand our enemy uh, so that we can better fight against them. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, this morning we're going to start off to talk about the work of demons. Last week we talked about some of the origin stories. Kind of in some, there seems to be a series of rebellions that have happened throughout time to create these dark forces of evil that are in rebellion against God. And ultimately their work from here on out is try to undermine the work of God, to assist the work of Satan and to destroy and oppress God's people, and really all people, and undermine God's benevolent plan for his creation. And so it's important for us to realize that that is their main purpose. But in the, in the New Testament, we see a specific way that demons interacted with humanity um, that I believe is unique to the first century, but very important to show what Jesus came to do when he came to this earth and died on the cross. And that is that they came to destroy and oppress human prosperity. Turn to, you've, I guess I already told you this, Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, we're going to read this account of a demon-possessed man. And... What we need to know about this word demon possessed in the Greek is it's the word demonized. Um, some translations might even pull out oppressed by a demon. I think that's maybe a better way of translating it, uh, oppressed by a demon. And we certainly see that oppression uh, in this man's life as well as other cases in the New Testament. Let's start reading there in verse 1, Mark chapter 5, verse 1. They came to the other side, the sea, to the country of Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. You'll see that a lot. Unclean spirit, impure spirit, uh, evil spirit, and demon are all interchangeable. Verse 3, he lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. 
And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he says, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I adjure to you, by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly, not to uh, send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us into the pigs, let us enter them. So he, came, he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering 2,000, rushed down uh, the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. All right, as we read that account, what are some things that stood out to you about uh, demons and how they oppress humanity here um, in the first century? Anything that you see about them? Okay, the demons knew who Jesus was. They knew his identity. And that kind of undermines some people's thoughts in our 21st century who want to look back at this and say, well, this was probably just mental illness, right? They just didn't know what it was. It was some type of seizure. It, it really wasn't demon possession. That kind of undermines it, right? Because the demons here are speaking, okay? They're speaking and they can identify Jesus, very good. Any other thoughts? Okay. So, yeah, they, they were afraid of what Jesus might do to him. Here it says, torment him. I think in Luke's account it actually says, don't throw us into the abyss, which is kind of an interesting thought. Um, but, yeah, they knew that he, he could do harm to them. Terry, what did you have? Mm -hmm. Right, right. That it, yeah, it is creepy to have an actual name, a designation, and it says we are a legion, uh, for we are many. And so um, what's interesting, a lot of times when you think about what the, the demons were doing, as well as what Jesus is doing here, at that time, they had their, uh, I think it's just part of their culture, they thought if you knew someone else's name and said the person's name, you had some power over them. And um, some people even think that today, like if you can conjure up like an evil spirit or something like that and, and call out their name, it somehow gives you some type of power. And so here, the, by naming Jesus, they're trying to have some power over him. And... Um, and also, if you think about what they are trying to do, what the demons are trying to do is undermine the, the ministry of Jesus, a lot of times it seems like they're trying to force the, the issue with Jesus, uh, that they're trying to reveal his identity before Jesus wants to reveal his identity. Um, and so they're trying to almost undermine uh, his ministry. Uh, we sp see that especially throughout the, the, the Gospel of Mark where uh, people will want to identify him, especially demons, and he will silence them. He'll say, shh, don't tell anyone yet. And he'll even say that to, to human beings that, that he you know, did a miracle for. He would say, don't tell it yet. He, his mission, uh, it was not ripe yet. It was not ready to be fulfilled there in Jerusalem. And so he would tell them um, uh, not to spread his name um, among other people. All right, so, yeah, go ahead, Kenny. This would be actually uh, Gentiles, where he, the region it is, and you can kind of tell it with the pigs. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah, the Gerasenes would be on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, where there would be some, some Gentiles, yeah. And that's, I think that's why later on, um, the, he tells the unclean spirit to go ahead and tell people, which is the opposite of what he told the Jews to do. In other words, he didn't view the Gentiles 
as a threat to rushing his mission. He only viewed the Jews as doing that. So, any other thoughts you can? Uh, Mm-hmm. How do they get their knowledge? Yeah. Well, you know, if, if they are uh, these heavenly creatures that have rebelled against God, they would have known a lot about Jesus um, uh, when they were created. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, they knew his power. And I think that maybe just goes along with them being a part of the spiritual realm, that they have a, a greater knowledge. Now, they're not uh, omnipotent and um, omniscient like God is. God is all-knowing. But uh, they're privy to a little bit more information than we are on, on some things. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. What happened to the pigs? What happened to the demons after the pigs died? Good question. I don't have a, a great answer to that. Do you... Have you thought about it? I don't know if the demons died with the pigs. Or... Well, that was not seen as them being, you know, tormented or thrown into the abyss. So I would think that that would be like a good thing for them. Uh, what we see in, in Matthew 12 and Luke 11 is this is somewhat, and we'll look at this next week, is somewhat of an illustration Jesus used about this man that has, has uh, had a demon cast out of him. And that demon, it goes around restless in waterless places. Which water, waterless places. I, I don't know the connection there. And then he doesn't find a suitable place for him to go. And so he comes back with seven demons worse than him. And the state is greater than it was before. You know, the, the after state is, is greater than him before. So uh, I think there's a possibility that they could uh, kind of freeze them to go searching for another host. But that is a complete guess. So, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of mysteries on this. What, what about the strength of this uh, demon possessed man? What could he do? Okay, okay. He, he was able to rip off the shackles and the chains. Uh, again, this undermines the idea that this was some type of mental illness. Uh, this man has superhuman strength because of his oppression by all these demons. And uh, so uh, th- their power is kind of being shown through as well. Right. Yeah. And what's interesting when it talks about that in Revelation 12, like they know their final um, destination, they, they don't just give up and say, well, if that's what's going to happen to us, <laughs> we're just going to give up. No, they, they get even, it's almost like they get even more agitated and, and angrier to try to undermine the church and God's plan through the church. Um, yeah, they, they know their ultimate destiny, um, but that doesn't stop them from terrorizing um, people today. Yeah, yeah, a lot of bacon. <laughs> That was ruined there. <laughs> All right. Anything else you see that, that pops out to you as we think about this man? I wonder how he lived in the tombs. Yeah, it just says he lived among the tombs. I don't know. I don't know. He He was certainly an outcast from society. I mean, you can't can't be that way without having it. That's, that really shows you the benevolence of what Jesus did in his, um, when he casted out demons, is that this was, this was a horrible thing to happen to a, a human being. It, it almost controlled their whole lives, you know. And, um, and uh, certainly Jesus casting them out was something that was uh, such a relief to them and their family and their friends. Uh, yeah, yeah, it seems like that. Yeah, he was, I mean, most people don't live among the tombs, uh, unless you're a zombie or something. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, it reminds me of that passage in First John 4 where it says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. You know, 
Even the prince of demons, we, we don't have to fear if we have Jesus on our side. He has that authority, that power to overcome whatever uh, oppression or difficulty or whatever it might be, we can overcome with Jesus. All right. Um, I want to talk for a little bit about the idea of demon possession today uh, because there's a lot that's, that's said in... Um, in the religious field and um, sometimes associated with Christianity, sometimes not associated with Christianity, where people talk about freeing people from, from demons. What I want you to, to realize as we think about that is first of all realize that we don't have any accounts of demon possession in the Old Testament. Um, the, only, the only maybe exception to that would be King Saul. But I don't think that's what's happening there. Um, I think that's a little bit of a, a different circumstance. Um, so when we come to the New Testament, it's very much like a new thing. And then as you get through the New Testament, it seems to fade off a little bit. Uh, we have four different accounts uh, in the book of Acts of uh, someone who was an apostle who casted out demons, okay? But we don't see much of anything after that in the New Testament. In fact, when we come to 1 Corinthians 12, and it's, it's speaking about all these miraculous gifts, the gifts of knowledge, of revelation, of tongues, of interpretation, of miraculous healing, it never mentions anything about casting out spirits. Um, and so that's an important thing to factor in. Another thing uh, that many have pointed to is in the book of Zechariah. Now, this is one of the last books in our Old Testament. In Zechariah chapter 12, it's a highly prophetic uh, book. It's got a lot of symbolism. Um, it's hard to understand in some ways. But what we can find in chapters 12 and 13 is really a focus on what Jesus was going to come and do and how God was going to begin his people, okay? Uh, we see that in chapter 12 and verse 10, where it said, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for, for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. All right, so here there is a mention of him who is pierced. And in the Bible, that re refers to... It's a reference to Jesus, right? We even see that in the book of Revelation, the beginning part of it. Uh, we see that in the Gospels, so Jesus was pierced in the side, water and blood came out. And so, um, and notice here, and when they look on me as one who mourns for a child, uh, wait, hold on. Yeah, when they look on me on him whom they have pierced. Who's the me here? It's Jesus speaking. It's Jesus speaking through the prophet Isaiah. So most people say, oh, that's God speaking. Well, it's the same thing, right? Jesus is God. All right, so this is kind of the context of it. Then let's move to uh, chapter 13. Chapter uh, 13, verse 1. And on that day there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. All right, so here we have Jesus being pierced, and the result of that, of him dying on the cross, is the removal the cleansing from sin and uncleanness. So again, we're talking about the life and ministry of Jesus. Then moving on to uh, verse um, verse uh, 7 of chapter 13. It says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts, Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. All right. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Who quoted that? Jesus did. When did he quote it? Do you remember? His last day is when the apostles mm -hmm. they would be scattered. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, his last, the last days and really the last supper. Uh, because they were pledging to Jesus, hey, we're going to be faithful to you even if, it, even if we have to be thrown in prison, even if we die, we will be faithful to the end. And Jesus says, actually, you're going to, to scatter uh, when I am struck. Um, and that's when Peter up the ante and said, no, he swore that he was not going to rebel against God. And that's when Jesus uh, said then that um, before the night over is over, he would deny him three times. So again, this kind of goes along with the, the time and ministry of Christ. Some even look there in chapter ten and verse, uh, chapter twelve and verse ten that we read before, that pouring out of the Spirit of grace and mercy. Uh, some see that as the the giving of the Holy Spirit that we see on the day of Pentecost. All right. So have that all in mind, that context in mind. We're talking about the life and ministry of Jesus and, and thereafter. And then look at verse uh, 2 of chapter 13. Verse 2. And on that day declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, so they shall be remembered no more. And also I will remove from the land the prophets and the spirit of uncleanness. Does anyone else have another way of translating that last phrase? Spirit of uncleanness? Unclean spirit. Uh, singular or plural? Okay, unclean spirit. All right. So th th this makes a lot of sense in the ministry of Jesus. That if we see here um, Israel at the time, <clears throat> excuse me, the Jewish people at that time, uh, they were they had put the idols of the Old Testament behind them, and they were trying to be faithful to the law. And then he says, I will remove from the land the prophets, which there's some debate among commentators whether this is a, a false prophet or prophets in general. Uh, if it's just prophets in general, it fits, along, uh, 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 it fits along with this idea that these miraculous gifts, specifically the miraculous gifts of prophecy, they ended near the end of the first century. And then here the spirit of uncleanness or the unclean spirit. And uh, it makes sense here that this is what uh, was part of what Jesus was trying to do for the people in his ministry, is to get rid of the unclean spirit, the demonic spirits of the time, and that there was an end to uh, the demon possession uh, that we find in the New Testament soon after the New Testament was completed. Any thoughts on that? Does that make sense? Do you have any thoughts? Does this Bible say that this chapter pictures the final days of the earth as we know it? Right. Yeah, it is. It is disagreeing with with what I say, and a lot of people who take that that viewpoint are um, kind of premillennial in their beliefs. They believe there's going to be like a thousand year reign of Jesus in Jerusalem. Um, but I think the context undermines that view, and that it's the last day because we've got here Jesus being struck as a shepherd and the sheep scattering, as he said was fulfilled in his lifetime. Uh, you see the, the his piercing. And they're mourning because of his piercing. Uh, we see him cleansing uh, of sin. Uh, certainly we wouldn't say God would wait to the end of time to cleanse uh, his people of sin. Um, that started with Jesus. So yeah, it, it is a, that's a common viewpoint for people who uh, have a differing view of, of the end times. Any more thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that especially verse 2 really seems to be uh, an emphasis on what was going to happen to Jerusalem after Jesus' ministry, right? The destruction of Jerusalem. It says the siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. I mean, there's a siege that's how Luke describes it, describes uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in his gospel, is that it will be a siege, that when you see the Roman armies come around you, then flee to the mountains. 
So it seems again to kind of flee. And, and some people will think, you know, on that day, like a singular day, that, that means that, oh, that must be the day, um, you know, the, the last day, um, the last uh, when Jesus comes. But it also can refer to like a, um, an indefinite period of time. Um, so we might say in that day in our language. All right, just something to think about. Um, I don't think we see um, uh, what we find in Mark chapter 5 and other places in our New Testament, the same type of um, level of what people call demon possession today. I, I don't think it's the same. It's not on par with what we see in the New Testament. They, demons don't have the knowledge. They don't have the power. I mean, there should be demons ripping a, uh, you know, apart chains, but that's just not happening. Um, and I think you can see that too with you know, people who say that there are you know, healing ministries um, uh, today um, that uh, you know, someone will come up on stage and they'll, they'll heal them right on the spot. Um, I, I just don't see the same level of miracle. <laughs> I don't even know if I would call what they do miracles. But, but the, the miracles in Jesus' time were immediate he had a withered hand. It was stretched out. It was completely healed. It was complete. It didn't go back. Um, and it was, uh, it was obvious uh, to all those who were around. So uh, you just kind of have to compare and tr- contrast what the New Testament presents versus what people are claiming today uh, when it comes to uh, demon possession and healing. So. When he when he healed, like the boy and whatnot, did he also did he pray to the father? There there are instances where he does pray. Um, I don't think we get an account on that all the time. Uh, I the one I I know for sure was with um, with Lazarus being raised from the dead. That's another thing. If we're if we're going to claim that people can do miracles by the hands of men today. We need to see some evidence of resurrection because there were people who were resurrected from the dead in the first century. You know, so I think that's what's happening with Eutychus in, in Acts chapter twenty. I mean, he falls out of the window. I mean, I don't think he's going to survive that. Uh, something that that's what happened with with uh, Paul when he was at um, was it uh, Lystra? Yeah, Lystra. He was stoned, I think, to death and dragged out of the city, left him for dead, and then. He got up and went back and preached. Um, but, yeah, it needs to be on the same par. If you're going to claim that happens today, it needs to be on the same par. It needs to be equivalent to what we see in the Bible. Yeah, usually what happens is they cure them of smoking or back pain or something like that. Or even if it's like, uh, you know, uh, if, if someone's been um, paralyzed or something, they, they might walk there on the spot in front of a crowd when there's a lot of adrenaline going, but... It might not last, and that, that's where that word complete comes in. You know, once the person is uh, healed, it, it's not like it, it reverts. You know, the, the withered hand doesn't become withered again, or um, you know, the, the blind person doesn't lose his sight again. You know, so. I mean, there's a lot of. I think there's a lot to that. Yes, go ahead. Right. They just don't have to Jesus. Oh yeah. It's not the it's not the type of oppression that we saw in the first century. Um, in fact, uh, Jesus opens the door for that in Matthew chapter twelve. Let's go ahead and look at it. I was gonna save it for next week, but uh, I've been studying it a lot recently. I'm I'm due to give a, a lecture on this at the Fried Hardman Lectures, and uh, it's uh, been kind of consuming my brain for the past few months as I've thought about that, uh, that lecture in February. Matthew chapter 12, 
this is when uh, the Pharisees are really um, trying to identify Jesus with Satan. He's casting out demons, they say. You're doing it by, um, you're doing that by the hand of, um, of Satan. And uh, Jesus obviously undermines that. It says a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. It makes sense that Satan would be against Satan. So uh, he pushes back on that. And then later on um, in verse 43, and he's, he's talked about their rejection. He's talked about their, their bad fruit. They were not um, producing the fruit of God. He gets down there to verse 43, Matthew 43, uh, 12, verse 43. Uh, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. And here's the key line to understand why he's saying this, okay? It says, so also will it be with this evil generation. So he's using the, this, this situation of a man having uh, a demon cast out of him and uh, the demon coming back with some of its friends. He's using that as an illustration of that generation. And I think specifically the unbelieving generation that is seen by the Pharisees. Now, some have tried to parse it out a little bit further and, and talked about what this this unclean spirit was that was cast out of that generation. And what, is, what are the spirits that are coming in to dwell? Well, um, and I think this, is, um, this lines up with what we see in the history of the Jewish people, is that the Jewish people had, in some ways, rid of themselves of the idolatry of the past. I mean, you look in the Old Testament, and it's idol, 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 idol. If there's a temptation that's going on with the people of Israel, it has to do with idolatry. I mean, it's, it's very, very much hand in hand, and eventually what, it's what leads to their exile. But even when they come back in, they start marrying these foreign ladies again, and, and they have idols again. So, again, there's just a constant battle. However, when you get the New Testament... That's not the case. They're not worshiping these false idols. Instead, you have people like the Pharisees, Pharisees who were very strict to obey the law, the Sadducees who cared for the temple, um, several different other groups that were trying to obey God the best they could so that God would bring in his, his Messiah and his kingdom. That's kind of how they viewed their obedience as a way to beckon the coming of the kingdom of God. So that's their mindset, and in some ways that's a good step, right? You're moving away from idolatry, and you're moving closer to the law. But what happened to these people who, who were uh, trying to obey the law so exactly? What happened to them? That's true. That's true. So, so what what happened to these? Okay. Okay. So, they they were dismissing the idols. Uh, they put that behind them, and then they moved on to trying to uh, not only just um, obey the law, but to obey the man-made version of the law, and to then teach those as the commandments of God. So that's part of what they did. The biggest part, though, the, the biggest sin was rejecting Jesus. And here in this same chapter, he, they're, they're calling Jesus um, Beelzebul. He's working this by the power of Satan. And so their unbelief, their rejection of Jesus really is... Uh, is this demon coming back into them with all of his friends and making their state uh, now in their rejection of Jesus worse than it was at first. Does that make sense? All right. They got rid of the, the, the idolatry, 
but then they missed the Messiah. And that is the worst thing that you can do. And you can kind of see that uh, earlier on in this passage is, um, as it talks about the judgment where even Sod- uh, well, Sodom and uh, Nineveh and the Queen of the South rise up against this generation and condemn it. All right? And so the reason I brought that up in, the, in reflection of, of what was said is that uh, we can still give a place to the devil. Okay? We'll look at this actually later tonight in our sermon where, uh, where Paul speaks about our anger. And let's go ahead and look at that. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 26. It says, Be angry and do not sin. So you can have righteous anger, right? You, you don't have to sin just because you're angry. But he says, Do not let the sun go down on your anger. That anger, if you allow it to simmer, can eventually cause bitterness, resentment, lack of forgiveness, the list goes on. It can lead to, uh, to great sins. Then verse 27 says, And give no opportunity to the devil. Anyone else have a, a different translation of that word opportunity? Place. Place. Any, any other? Foothold. Foothold. Okay. Yeah. Um, the word is, is tapos, which is often translated uh, place. And the, the analogy I heard about this is it's kind of like you're, you're inviting Satan in your front door. And you might let him be in maybe a guest room. But if you allow him to do that, eventually he's going to own the house. Okay? And um, what was that? Yeah. He, he can own us. And he can control us. And we'll see that in the life of Judas this evening as we look at that is that if we open the door, then he can become our ruler. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, there, there are situations where people have just given themselves over so much to Satan, allowed him to be the ruler of their lives with no fighting back, and, and they just become so corrupt and de- desensitized and evil and so forth. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Currently doing it, it may have caused some physiological damage at some point, and that it's just crazy the stuff you see and the way some people are because of that. It just changed them. Certainly. They're out of control. Right, and and I think those are tools of Satan. You know, he he uses that addiction to fuel that kind of behavior. Um, he uses, I mean, and. They always taught me this in, in the D.A.R.E. programs I was a part of growing up was, you know, don't even try it once. Because if you try uh, substance abuse once, then it can lead to, to uh, it's, they call it kind of a gateway into other kinds of behavior as well as just addiction. So uh, I think that kind of goes along with what we're saying here with uh, don't give a foothold, don't give a place, don't give a, an opportunity for the devil because if you give him any space, he's going to work and he can take over and, and terrorize people and have horrible consequences on people's lives and their families and their friends. Um, but they're, they're, not, they're not demon-possessed like we see in the first century. So, Any more thoughts? It's good. It's good. All right, here's a few things I think we have about seven minutes left. A few other things about the work of the dark forces of demons. Um, I already mentioned they tried to destroy Jesus' work by revealing his identity before he wanted them to. He, they fight against spiritual beings. We see evidence of this in Daniel 10. We've looked at that in the series 
Ephesians 6, where there's this fight, not against flesh and blood, but in all these principalities and authorities. Um, but the one I want to focus on in the last seven minutes is that demonic activity um, it can be very much at work uh, within our lives. And we have to be careful of that. Uh, and one of the ways that it can, can happen, that it, it seems so insidious, is through false teaching. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter three, uh, chapter four. First Timothy chapter four. You know, sometimes we might ask the question: when it comes to a teaching of the church, does it really matter? Does it, why, why does God really care about this or that, whatever the doctrine is? Um, and sometimes we can be very casual in. Uh, the teaching and the practice of the church. But look here in verse uh, chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will come, some will <clears throat> excuse me, depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. All right, so we have demonic doctrine, verse 2, through the insincerity of liars whose conscience, consciences have seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. All right, so here we have these doctrines of demons. And how is it manifested uh, in the, the sins that we see listed here, or the teachings that are listed here? Okay. Uh, or they have made, taken what God, what they perceive that God has told us to do and turn it to fit what they want to do. Okay, so we have some people who are taking the teachings of Christ and they're turning it for, to suit their own passions or their own desires. Here in this case, it's a restrictive thing. Okay, uh, here... In, okay, I'll get to her. Uh, verse 3, it says, Who forbid marriage... And require abstinence from foods that God created. So they're, they're saying, uh, for instance, in our day and time, you have to keep the kosher law, even though God has declared all things good for us to eat. Or they'll say, you know, uh, you can't get married, especially if you hold this certain position in this church, right? And so they're, they're restricting here. Now, the opposite is true. Uh, we see in the book of Revelation... Shirley, before we move on, did you have something that you wanted to say? Okay. Revelation chapter 2, we see uh, with the church in Thyatira um, that here the um, encouragement, the teaching that is going on is not restrictive, but it's permissive. It's do whatever you like. Seize the day. Carpe diem, right? Um, we had a preacher one time that always talked about grab for all the gusto. And uh, I always remember that. Uh, verse 20 uh, of Revelation 2, But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, so she claims to be a teacher, a mouthpiece of God, and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrifice to idols. And so here's the other opposite end of the spectrum. Anything goes. And so uh, you kind of have the pendulum swing. Um, and actually at the end, I forgot about this, um, verse 24, but to the rest of you in Thyatira who do not hold to this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. So we see its source. The source of this teaching is from Satan. And so uh, we don't need to be uh, casual in our understanding of, of the teaching of the church. It's very important that we try to be faithful, uh, that we, are, uh, we, we hold up our fidelity to the teachings of Christ and the Bible and not be strayed to and fro by our desires to, to enforce or relax any of God's law. 
All right. Let me look. Okay, I got one minute left. Uh, we'll pick up on the other ones next week, and uh, so I don't want to rush through those verses. Um, but we'll we'll just focus next week on what Jesus did when he came and what he did to undermine the works of demons and of Satan, and then later on how we can overcome that uh, in our lives as we try to overcome Satan uh, and temptation uh, each day of our lives. Thank you.
see young Abe up there. <laughs> if y'all haven't seen Jacob lately, he reminds me of pictures of young Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> so I call him Abe all the time. Good to see everyone out this morning. Just got a few items here before we get going. Uh, the uh, Of course, everybody's been talking and, and the recent tornadoes going through Arkansas, Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, and things that can be done. The uh, Of course, just close to here over in Mayfield, Kentucky, uh, Kathy has uh, immediate family over there, and they're they're okay. Uh, the town of Mayfield was hit pretty bad downtown, and some public housing. And I've been in touch with uh, Kathy's uh, cousin's husband, who's a elder at the uh, Seven Oaks Church over there, and they are, are providing a lot of assistance to the people. And then there's also a church at the north end of town. Seven Oaks is at the south end. North Side is at the north end of town. Both are, are providing a lot of assistance over there. The uh, Churches of Christ Disaster Relief has already sent in trucks to Seven Oaks. I think the schedule shows North Side and Benton, Kentucky will be receiving today, if I remember right. And then there are delivering you can get on their website and and uh, it'll show their deliveries that they're going through in Tennessee and Arkansas so I've been in touch with Marty uh, Moses over at Seven Oaks asking what can be done to help them uh, they've been providing uh, assistance and he uh, and the other elders are going to get together uh, today during service and uh, they're supposed to let me know uh, some things that could be done to help them over there. Uh, so I'll be uh, updating everyone once we uh, get some information from him on that. So as soon as I get it, we'll, uh, we'll get the information out. Things that will be happening here, uh, Snacks with Santa on December the 22nd after our evening surface. So uh, you can just bring your favorite snack or finger food to share with everyone on that. And then uh, the ladies uh, are going to have their annual ornament exchange at the Hickory Log December 16th at 4.30 that afternoon. Uh, they'll be planning on taking the church bus, so just let Linda Alexander know if you plan on attending that. And then uh, this evening after our uh, service, uh, no, it's next week's service, excuse me, December the 19th, uh, we'll do our card ministry after that. Uh, and then after that, we'll intend to do that every third Sunday uh, in the future on that. Uh, Nicole and Allie have provided us with Ten names of some kids in the uh, community that are in need of some Christmas things. Uh, we've got those names on strips of paper, and I've got them laid out in the elder's office on the table there. And then the, there's a list of those names. And if you would be willing to go in there and get one of those names and then write your name on the list for the one you've uh, selected. Uh, it would be greatly appreciated. Uh, those kids are in, in need of some Christmas items. And then I believe Nicole, she not here? Uh, Allie, was it they need to be back Wednesday night? Yeah. Okay. We've got a short, short turnaround to purchase, so if you can get the name, and get your items here Wednesday night uh, for Nicole and Allie. They can take those uh, back to the schools uh, where they're needed on that. Some updates on our prayer list.
Uh, Donna and Paulette are able to be back with us. Glad to see that. Uh, Shane Aker, we announced he was having problems with his uh, knee replacement surgery and having an infection. He is doing better now. Uh, I misspelled his name in the bulletin here. Uh, the, the acres that are spelled like A-C-R-E are out around Brosley, and uh, Shane's name is E-A-K-E-R. So uh, that's my fault. Adam just put down what I wrote. So Shane and his family uh, go to Harville Church down there. Those are the updates I have. As we get more information, like I said, on the tornado, we'll be updating you on that. Uh, Elijah is ready to lead us in our service. Let's be standing for the first song this morning. It's a beautiful song and a beautiful thought. Let's, <clears throat> let's enjoy this this morning. We'll sing, we'll sing all three verses of this one. What a song of delight in that city so bright will be wafted neath heaven's fair dawn. How the ransom will raise happy songs in his praise when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, whenever a sorrow will come, there'll be no place like home. When all God's singers get home as we sing here on earth songs of sadness or mirth tis a foretaste of rapture to come but our joy can't compare to the glory up there when all of God's singers get home when all of God's singers get home whenever a sorrow will come There'll be no place like home when all God's singers get home. Having overcome sin, hallelujah, amen, will be heard in that land or the foam. Every heart will be light and each face will be bright when all God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, whenever a sorrow will come, there'll be no place like home when all of God's singers get home. Be seated. Sing 419, and then we'll have our opening prayer. We'll sing verses, we'll sing the first three verses of this one. Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain. Shall we seek thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek? In compassion now descend, fill our hearts with thy rich grace, tune our lips to sing thy praise, tune our lips to sing thy praise, in thine own appointed way, now Till a blessing thou bestow. Uh, 
Let's go to our Father in prayer. Well, Lord, we are thankful for this beautiful day. Thankful for our many blessings. Thank you most of all for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you will be with those that have lost loved ones, have lost their houses. You know, there were several tornadoes, and we know, Lord, that a lot of destruction and several lives lost. We ask that you will be with those. and Let us be mindful of them. May we be able to help them in any way we can. Ask that you will go with us <coughs> to these upcoming days. and Let us be mindful of all these things, knowing all blessings come from thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we start to direct our minds towards the Lord's Supper. We'll sing number five. <clears throat> and we'll sing, we'll, we'll go ahead and sing all three of this one. There are things as we travel this earth shifting sands that transcend all the reason of man. But the things that matter the most in this world, they can never be held in our hand. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe cling to that old rugged cross. I believe that the Christ who was slain on the cross has the power to change lives today. For he changed me, me completely a new life is mine that is why by the cross i will stay i believe <coughs> called mount calvary i believe whatever Time has surrendered and earth is no more. I'll still cling to that old rugged cross. I believe that this life with its great mysteries Surely someday will come to an end, but faith will conquer the darkness and death, and will lead me at last to my friend. <clears throat> I believe in a hill called. Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and earth is no more, I'll still cling to that old rugged cross.
At this time of the service, we come together to remember and memorialize the suffering, the death of Jesus Christ on the cruel cross so that we might have hope of eternal life. But not only is it a time to remember that, it's also a time to, to look at us and our lives. If we look at 1 Corinthians 11, 27-29, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. If we honestly sit back and examine our hearts, we'll see how sinful we are how desperately we need God's grace, God's love, Christ's death to save us from our, our sins. It's also a time that we should redirect our lives to Him. 1 Corinthians 10 and 21, You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the Lord's table and the table of demons. If we are fully dedicated to serving Him and striving our best, we will help to keep the demons out of our life. We have to look to Him, His suffering, and most of all, His love to help us through life. Jesus' death on the cross was the one thing that will ultimately and permanently set aside our sins. So at this time, let's focus on Christ, His suffering and death on the cross. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, again, we look to you for faith and guidance. We thank you for the perfect plan that you put in place through Christ's death that we might have hope of eternal life and hope that we'll have eternity, we spend eternity with you. Lord, we pray that we'll take this bread in a manner that's pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name, amen. Let's bless the cup. Lord, as we're about to take this fruit of the vine that represents Christ's blood on the cross, blood that was shed that we may again have hope for eternal life, blood that ran down his body and pooled under the cross, we pray that we'll always remember his suffering, his pain, his humiliation. We pray to take this cup in a manner that's pleasing to thee. In Christ's name, amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. At this time, we've been instructed to lay by in store on the first day of the week uh, to give as Lord has prospered you. Uh, we're going to take up that offering now. Uh, a lot of people think more and more that this time of season, you know, the needs of the church, you know, the needs are there always throughout the year. Uh, we appreciate all the generous giving this here at Green Forest Church of Christ. This time, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you've given us, spiritual, material, financial, Lord. We thank you that we live in a country where we're all so prosperous, Lord, but we also realize that there are others out there who aren't as prosperous as, as we. Lord, we pray that this collection will be spent wisely by the elders to further your works throughout the world, throughout the community. Lord, we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.
sing 837 before we have the lesson. Let's be standing for this song. <clears throat> song was written for people who were standing. The guy that wrote it was probably standing when he wrote it. Um, this is an energetic song, so let's be energetic about it this morning. Um, we're going to sing... I want to sing all three verses. Might as well. It's a good song. <clears throat> It thrills my soul to hear the songs of praise we mortals sing below. And though it takes the parting of the ways, yet I must onward go. I hope to hear throughout a number of days the song earth cannot know. They sing in heaven a new song of Moses and the Lamb. Oh, to hear the angel sing, to bid me welcome to mansions bright and fair. Oh, to hear the angel ringing, <coughs> says bland. Ending rich and rare. Oh, to see the master bringing this cry I may own and wear. Oh, hear that mighty chorus sweetly sing. I want to hear. To hear it swell and ring The greatest joy that I have ever known Is praising Him in song I know someday when I have older grown My voice will not be strong but if good seed for Jesus I have sown, with angels I'll belong. They sing in heaven a new song of Moses and the Lamb. Oh, to hear the angels singing, to bid me welcome to mansions bright and fair. Oh, to heart ringing with voices blending rich and rare. Oh, to see the master bringing a precious crown that I may own and wear. Want to hear, hear that mighty chorus sweetly sing. I want to hear, to hear it swell and ring the sweet song that earth can ever boast was sung when Christ was born. Yet he who walked the Galilean coast sometimes was sad forlorn. He left the earth to send the Holy Ghost to guide us till that morn. They sing in heaven a new song of Moses and the Lamb. Oh, to hear the angels singing, to bid me welcome to mansions bright and fair. Oh, to hear the glad harps ringing with voices blending rich and rare. I want to hear the master bringing 
a precious crown that I may own and wear. I want to hear, want hear that mighty chorus sweetly sing. I want to hear, to hear it swell and ring. You see this. Wasn't bad for my first time leaning it. I don't think I kind of fumbled through it, but it sounded all right to me. We'll have our scripture reading now, and then we'll have our lesson. <clears throat> Today's reading comes from Revelations chapter 14. That's Revelations chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with Him 144,000 who had His name and His Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim those who dwell on earth to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory, because the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who, <clears throat> who made heaven and earth the sea, and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon, the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immor immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast, and its image receives a mark on the forehead or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night. These worshipers of the beast and its image and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Good morning. Are you awake? Good morning. Good to, see, good to see so many people here this morning. If you'll keep your Bibles there to Revelation 13 and 14, that's where we're going to be this morning. One of the last things you want to do is be in the car with me, have the radio playing, and one of my favorite songs comes on. Now that's not because I can't carry a tune in a bucket. I can do okay. I'm, I'm not Paul McCartney or Mick Jagger, but I can do okay. And it's not that I don't know the song. I can hum along and I can play my air guitar along with the best. But it's the lyrics. Sometimes the lyrics get to me. 
Sometimes I don't remember the verses. I, I can do the course okay, but when it comes to the verses, it's just hard to remember. Click the next slide for me. It's not working. And so sometimes I, I will, even though, even though I, I know I don't know the lyrics, I will still try to sing along, okay? Even if it's to my own embarrassment, I will continue to try and sing along, and, and it doesn't always work out so hot. Are you good at remembering lyrics? That is not a talent of mine at all. But really, one day, all it's going to come down to is my knowledge of one set of the lyrics and one set of lyrics alone. I pray that all of us, every single one of us, will know the lyrics to that song. Because that song is the one that shows that we have been fully redeemed by the Lamb. The song is found in Revelation 14. It's called the New Song, and that's where our song we just sang got its inspiration. And there in, in chapter 14, in verse 3, we find out about this new song that, that only 144,000 can sing this new song. Only they know the lyrics. And where this song comes into play is it's important for us to get, kind of get a, a zoomed out uh, view of this book and, and of this, this song and what it means. And I think a big part of that is looking one chapter ahead to chapter 13. In chapter 13, we see why this new song is so important. And we see the meaning this new song will have to our life one day. In chapter 13, we get images, two images of ferocious beasts. One comes from the sea and, and one comes from the land. The one that came from the sea, it represents the emperor of Rome. And there in chapter 13 and verse 7, it says this, Also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them, and the authority was given it over every trial, tribe and every people and, and language and nation. And all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life, excuse me, book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. And so what we find here is that this emperor who had this authority over all these nations and tribes and peoples and languages, that he was wanting his people under his charge to worship him. He wanted to be worshipped as God as he was the emperor of Rome. Now we come to the second beast, and, and the second beast seems to be the local enforcers of this imperial cult, and that is the worship of the emperor. They are forcing the people in their local settings to worship the first beast, to worship the Roman emperor. Look there in verse 12. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast. Beast. That is, that is its mission, is to get all the inhabitants of the earth to worship the Roman emperor. And then move on to verses 16 and 17. And it also causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. What they were doing here by trying to force people to worship the emperor was to make the business that they did contingent on them bowing their knee to Caesar. And so here what was on the line was their job. They might lose their job because of their faith in Jesus. They had to make a choice, worship the emperor or lose my job. Some had to, to give up the ability of going to the marketplace where there would be plenty of food for their family. And so their, their decision was worship the emperor or, or lose this ability to go and shop for my family. For many of them, they, they thought about the social ramifications, how so much went on there at that, that marketplace. And, and they had to make the decision, worship the emperor 
or lose my ability to participate in the social activities of my city. They had this, this decision to make. Maintain their beliefs in Jesus and lose something, lose their business, lose their job, lose their ability to shop, lose their social standing, or give in and bow their knee to Caesar. It was quite a temptation for the people in the first century. And I think a, a way to parallel it to our day and time is the, the taking of the vaccine here as of late. Now, I'm not going to get political, so don't, don't worry about that. I'm just going to tell you an observation that I've seen a lot in our country, especially since these mandates have been happening with the COVID-19 vaccine. What a lot of people have faced here recently was that decision. Take the vaccine or lose your job. And there's been some who have had strong beliefs against this, this vaccine that have chosen to lose their job. Some people have, have had to decide between taking the vaccine and, and being able to go to concerts or going to, to uh, sports stadiums or, or to, to travel. And so they had to make a choice. Go against their beliefs on this vaccine or be able to do the things that they want to do. And so they had to make this decision. And what I've seen so often is, is when someone sees a need that they have in their life, such as their job, putting food on the table, paying the electric bill, when they see that need or, or even something they like, like participating in, in these concerts and in these stadiums and in this travel, that when they are pushed up against those things, they give up their previous beliefs about this vaccine and compromise those beliefs in order to do what they need, to do what they want. And so here, they're making this, this decision. Go against your beliefs on this vaccine. Go against them and compromise. Or instead, lose something that they consider significant in this Life. Now let's, for instance, think about if our government came and mandated something against our Christian beliefs in our, in our country. Consider what would happen if, if the government came down with a mandate and said, you will lose your job, you will lose your job if you don't deny Christ. If you don't deny Christ, you will lose your job. What if they came to you and said, you can't travel anymore unless you praise Allah? What if they said you have to agree with, with homosexuality and transgenderism or you won't be able to go and, and see your favorite sports team? That's the kind of decisions that this first century audience was making. And, and some of them... They compromised their faith. They compromised their beliefs because they, they just felt like they couldn't go without the marketplace. They couldn't go without their job. They couldn't go out. They couldn't go without the social interaction that they prized so very much. They had to ask themselves the question, will I change my beliefs for something that I need or something that I like? And what here, they're, they're trying to encourage the, 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 these, these groups of Christians to maintain their faith in Jesus and not bow their knee to Caesar. But you can imagine just how terrorizing that would be for so many of them. How terrorizing it would be to know that they could lose all they have. They could lose their livelihood. They could lose their family if they didn't bow their knee to Caesar. That would have to be a very frightening thing for them, for sure. But after this, this vision of these two beasts making war against the saints, we get a different vision in chapter 14. Here, John says in verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And so here he looks up, he sees a mountain, and he sees God and the Lamb and, and, and God's people there far removed from the land, far removed from the sea, far removed from these beasts that were terrorizing the earth. In other words, what it's saying is if you don't compromise your faith, 
If you don't compromise your faith, if you, if you don't bow your knee to Caesar, that God will one day put you in this safe and secure place far removed from these beasts where they can't do anything to terrorize you anymore. One day, you can be on that mountain with God forever and ever. Now, some have some conflict with this idea of 144,000. A lot of religious groups will try to take this as a, a literal thing. This is the literal number of the people who will be saved. But as we look at the book of Revelation, what we find over and over is it uses a lot of figurative and symbolic language. And at that time, in the first century, the, 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 the number 12 was a significant... perfect or totally complete. And then you take the thousand. You have 12 times 12 times a thousand. Well, that day and time, the, a common grouping of a brigade was a thousand men. And so what we're getting here by having four, 12 by 12 times 1,000, 144,000, is this idea. This is the totality of the Lord's army. That this is the Lord's army standing and proclaiming victory. That they have won the fight against sin. They have won the fight against the beast. They have won the fight against Satan and his angels. That they have won the victory finally and for all. And as they do, they sing this new song. This new song that only them know the lyrics to. This is a, a celebratory passage as they, they praise God for the salvation that they have from the earth and from sin in eternity. And what's interesting as we continue on, we get some idea of, of what it means to be a part of this 144,000, what it means to be in the Lord's army. I know we sing that in VBS, right? I'm in the Lord's army. Well, here we get the, an idea, an understanding of what it means how we, each one of us, can be in the Lord's army. How we can be in that great chorus one day. And the first thing he gives in verse 4 is that it's those who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. This idea of, of virginity was often a, an image used in the Old Testament of the people of Israel when they were faithful to God. In fact, when they were unfaithful to God, they were called adulteresses or harlots. That was the terminology used against them. And so here, looking at God's people and thinking about what this means, it has the, the connotation that God's people are going to be faithful even when there is idolatry around, even when it's tempting to, to worship this emperor as a god, even though he's not, that if they can keep pure, if they can be faithful to God and worship Him and Him alone, then they can make it on this mount. They can have salvation on Mount Zion. Second, what we see about these people is they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. They're following Jesus, right? And, and we should understand that, right? That, that we must follow Jesus in order to, to be in heaven. That's a very natural belief for us Christians to have. However, think about that phrase, wherever he goes. Where did the lamb go? Well, the lamb went to the cross to be slain for our sins. And what this has a connotation of for us today is if we want to be who God wants us to be, if we want to be in that army, we have to follow Jesus even if it means our own death. Even if there are negative consequences to our life, we must go to our own slaughter so that we can be faithful to our God. And so here it has the idea of being faithful even when there are consequences to our faith. The third thing that's pointing out here at the end of verse 4 is that they have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God. Now, first fruits in the Old Testament was a, a sacrificial thing that, that the, the Jewish people did. And they would give the very first part of their harvest and devote that to God, and then they would live off the rest. And so this has the connotation of, of, of people who are devoted to God and God alone. 
They're not devoted to any other thing. They're not devoted to the things of the world. They're devoted to God. That is where their allegiance lies. And finally, it says, In their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. This again is Old Testament sacrificial language, where they were to offer an unblemished lamb or or an unblemished creature to, to offer to God to receive forgiveness or to praise God. And here, God's people have to be the same. We can't be blemished by the world. We can't be polluted by the world. We need to be pure. We need to, in some way, separate ourselves from the world, right? We're in the world, but not of the world. And so here, God's people, they are pure. They are people who don't compromise their faith to live according to the world, but live devoutly to our God and Him alone. So those are the people. Those are the kinds of people who will be on that mountain one day. They're people. People who are faithful to God, even in the midst of idolatry. People who will follow the Lamb, even if there are consequences to their life. They're people who are fully devoted and unpolluted by the world around us. Those are the people who will be saved from the beast. It's those who will be saved from the judgment to come. And that's really what the next section is about, is this judgment that's coming upon the people and upon the world. Verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel proclaimed to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give Him glory because the hour of His judgment has come and worship Him who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water. In other words, worship God, not the emperor. Judgment is coming. Verse 8, another angel, a second followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. Babylon here is an, an image for the Roman emperor, the Ro- Roman empire. And it's saying here of the empire that it will fall. It probably would blow their minds in that day and time to think of Rome falling because how great and powerful it was. But it says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Here, we know in our time that Babylon did fall. That the Roman Empire did fall. That God performed judgment against them. But what's more, even more relevant to us is verse 9 and following where it says, And another angel... A third followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image, and receives a mark on his forehead, or on his hand, he will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, These worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Here it says those who pledge allegiance to Babylon will go down with the ship. They will be judged alongside these empires of the world. If they devote themselves to anything other than God, that they will suffer the wrath of God. They will have to drink from the wrath of God. They will endure sulfur and and fire. And they will have no rest at all. And the smoke, the smoke goes up forever and ever. It is so important that we are singing that new song one day. It's so important that we're a part of that 144,000, the the complete total, totality of God's people. It's so important that we avoid the wrath of God. To come, And here, the next verse shows really what, what John and what God wanted from this passage among these congregations. And that is, he wanted endurance. There in verse 12 it says, And here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. He says, in the midst of all this, this terror of these beasts, I want you to endure Because only those who endure to the end will be saved. 
Then verse 13, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Those who finish their race, whether they, they die because of martyrdom, whether they die faithful to God, even through the calamities of this earth, blessed, blessed are the dead. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest. The people who, who pledged allegiance to Caesar, who bowed their knees to him, they will find no rest. And he says, they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Here, this passage really shows us that how we live our life from this, on, this point on until we die will determine, it will determine if we're in that number or not. If we're in God's course or not. If we're in His army or not. It will determine whether we will be blessed for eternity or if we will be tormented forever and ever. And I, I know that's something that, that we as a people in our society don't really think about too much. We don't think about the, the consequences of, of our lifestyles, the consequences of, of our compromise, the consequences of being devoted to something other than, than God. We don't think about that. In fact, most of us probably walk around thinking all the time that we and our, our friends and our family members, well, well, they're just all going to heaven, right? we're generally good people. We do more good things than bad things. And because of that, we probably will be in that number, right? You'll see this a lot of times at, at, uh, at funerals, that you never hear about anyone, never hear about anyone going to tor torment. You, you never have someone stand up there and says, well, because of the life that they live, we know they're in torment right now. You never hear that. And I think you and I would agree that would be highly insensitive but then again, what you hear all the time at funerals is, is that there are people who, some of them aren't Christians, and if they were Christians, they didn't act like Christians, but people will stand up there and, and eulogize them, and they will say, oh, we know that they're in a better place. Do we know that? Often in our society, we make it seem like the road to heaven is this, this wide highway that everyone's going. But Jesus says the road that leads to life is narrow. Few there are who find it. The path that leads to destruction, it is wide. It is an interstate. It is a highway to hell. The way of living to have life eternally is narrow. It is small. Only a few find it. We need to remember that. I know that's not something for us uh, to, to think upon that we think is pleasant, but it is something that we do need to think upon. It is a, a necessary thing for us to remember each day of our lives that whether we will be in that number or not depends on us enduring to the end of living that devoted, uncompromised, that pure life before God. That following Jesus wherever He goes is such an important part of our faith. And so I want you to look at your own life this morning and ask yourself, will you be singing that new song? The reason that only the, the 144,000 can sing that new song is only them have been fully redeemed by the Lamb. The angels can't see it. They haven't been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We can't sing it right now because we haven't been fully redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Only those who cross the finish line will be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and will be singing this, this new song forever and ever, praising God for His salvation over the world, over sin, over death itself. Will you be singing that song? If you want to sing that song, endure to the end. Don't compromise your faith. But be someone who's devoted to God. Well, follow Him wherever He takes you, whatever consequences there are in your life, that you will be faithful to Him. And I think a part of us getting on that road that, that, that ends in victory is us looking at our lives right now and saying, am I compromising anything right now in my faith for my job? Am I compromising anything in my faith right now 
to be seen as, as popular or cool or important by other people? Am I compromising anything in my life right now that, 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 that helps me to, to look better in front of other people? Am I compromising anything in my life right now because of friends and family members that maybe don't approve of my faith? Am I compromising anything right now for anything in the world? The thing is, so many times we want to hold on to the world. Even though we say we belong to Jesus, we don't hold on to the world. What we see in Scripture over and over again is when we hold on to the world, we lose heaven. If we hold on to the world, we will lose heaven. Do you hear that, church? However, if we hold on to the Lamb and lose the earth, lose the world, we will gain eternity with the Lamb forever and ever. And we will sing this beautiful, beautiful song. Look at your own life. Are you enduring to the end? Are you living an uncompromised, pure, and devoted life for Jesus right now, following Him wherever you go? If not, change that today. It's not about how you start, it's how you end. Let's endure to the end so all of us, all of us will have no trouble with those lyrics one day. So all of us can sing salvation to our God forever and ever because of all that He has done for us to save us from judgment, save us from sin, to save us from the ferocious beast of the world. Let's all sing that song one day. And let's live the life that leads to singing that song. Let's pray together. Dear God, our Father, we're so grateful that we see that, that one day we can be far removed from the troubles of this earth, that we can be in the presence of the Lamb forever and ever that we all can have the redemption that comes with Jesus, where we will go to a place without, without mourning, without death, without sickness, without pain, where you will wipe away each one of our tears. We long for those days. We sing about those days. We sing even about singing that new song with you forever and ever. But help us, Lord, as, as your people now, to understand that, that, that we don't get there just because we're generally good people. We get there by following the Lamb wherever He goes, by living pure and uncompromised lives before You. And help us each day to, to, to make sure that we're, yes, in the world, but not of the world, that we aren't dividing our allegiance between You and something else. Help us put all that behind us, because nothing is, is worth losing our salvation. Help us to remember that each day. Help us to endure to the end, so that we can be saved. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe there's someone who needs to start that race this morning, become a Christian, to pledge your allegiance to the Lord Jesus and say, He is Lord, He is the Son of God, and to be baptized into Christ. Repenting of your sins so that you live for God, devoted to Him and not to anything else. Maybe you need to be baptized this morning. We would encourage you to do that. It is so important that we take action while we have the chance to be in that number when we are on that mount with the Lamb. Maybe there's someone here this morning that's gotten away from it. You've compromised your faith for one reason or another, for your family, for your friends, for, for your job, for, for your social standing, and, and you just need to ask for help and prayers of the congregation to get you on that straight and narrow path to make sure that you are in that number one day. We'd love to help you. Whatever needs you have, please come forward as we stand and sing this invitation song. All to Jesus I surrender all. To Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence. Daily live. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to
to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus I surrender, humbly at His feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all, all to Jesus I surrender, Lord, I give myself to Thee, fill me with Thy love and power, let Thy blessings fall on me. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender Sing 372 for our closing song. Um, this will be the second song today that I have never led. Um, so I hope this one goes a little bit better than the last one. Um, but I don't know. I'll keep doing this and hopefully one day I'll get good at it. But um, we'll sing. We'll Yeah, we'll sing 372. Um, I, I'm going to try to do all of them. But if I get really unconfident through the second verse, I'll stop. <laughs> I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus, this my plea. Daily let it ever be. Just a closer walk with thee. Though through world of toils and snares. If I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? Let me walk close to Thee. Just a closer walk with thee. Granted, Jesus, this my plea. Daily let it ever be. Just a closer walk with thee. When my feeble is o'er. Time for me will be no more. Guide me to that peaceful shore. Let me 
walk close to Thee, just a closer walk with Thee. Grant it, Jesus, this my plea. Just a closer walk with Thee. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, once again we thank You for this another day that You've given to us. Thank you for this avenue of prayer that we have, that we can come to you, and thank you for all the things that we have, especially your son Jesus. For the, We thank you for being able to come here this morning as soldiers of Christ, to sing songs of praise to you, to read the Bible, to pray to you, to, to hear another lesson from your word. Just want to thank you for all those things, Father, especially for your son Jesus. And in taking of the communion, we, we know that we remember the death and burial that he suffered for us, that perfect sacrifice. Father, we also want to ask for those who have been affected by the tornadoes that went through the other night, whatever their needs, we pray that you'll take care of it. Guide us in all things, Father, and strengthen us and help us to be obedient to you. It's through your Son we do pray it all. Amen. Did great. <laughs>